excuse us for a second while we take the remote away from Dr. Che. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna start. Which camera are we? That one? The black one. Oh. Hi, I'm Sarah Bliss, for you that don't know me. Um, I'm the communications coordinator for Cambry. And for those that are new, we have this seminar every month on the first Thursday of the month. Um, during the semester. So we have six of these a year about. Um, this one is going to, well, I'll let her explain what it is about in a minute, but next month we're going to have one on presenting an eye poster, which is new for everybody this year. So you might want to tune in next month so you can see how to do your eye posters online for the symposium. Please remember to fill out the evaluation for the seminar. It's online. Your coordinators should supply that link to you. It's also on our website under the undergraduate tab. And um, I think that's all I have for now. So we will get started with the presentation. So um, you want to introduce yourselves and, and get going. Well, I'm Sherry Fleming, and we're going to talk today about how you maintain a lab notebook. Um, this notebook is your proof that you've been doing experiments in the lab and shows what Okay, we don't quite know what happened, but we'll get this going again in a second. Sorry, everybody. And I want to remind everybody to mute your microphone at your campus so that um, we can't hear you rustling around also. Peace. Okay. Now we need to bring back up her presentation. Um.
for technical geniuses. Thank you for standing by. Is it working now? Yes, OK. So we're going to talk about lab notebooks really quick before it dies again. Um, we want to know what you did and how you did it and what you were thinking. So the purpose of this notebook is to maintain your record of everything that you've done. Um, it is a legal document, so make sure that it's legitimate. Um, and it will defend you against ac accusations um, if you've done a good job with it. You can plan your experiments in it. You can build on your results and figure out where you're going. And you can learn from your mistakes if you do a good job of filling out your lab notebook or writing your lab notebook. Why does your PI care? That's what's good for you. What does your PI care about? The PI cares about it being an insurance policy to protect you and the PI from claims of fraud or plagiarism, misconduct, other such things. So as I said earlier, it's that legal document for the grants. NIH can actually come and audit the records of your lab notebook and for any NIH grant. So that means that, A, they have to be able to understand what you did, how you did it, and verify what you did. If a patent's applied for, the notebook is proof of what you've done for that patent and part of the intellectual property law. After you leave, the PI is going to keep that notebook for at least five years, and they can use that your data for writing grants, for writing papers, doing additional experiments. And to do that, they have to know what you've done. So that's all the legal stuff. What do you actually put into this notebook? What are the basics? Well, first of all, it's got to be legible. Somebody else has to be able to read it. And second, you need enough information there that it means something to someone, OK? Um, if you're going to use abbreviations, I use them all the time. We all use them. Define them someplace, OK? I use a special little abbreviation for centrifuge because it's a long word. I don't want to write it out. But it has to be defined at least someplace in your lab notebook. Most PIs are going to request that you write in English so that they can understand it. If it's going to be something important legally, then you want to date it. You want to keep it someplace where it's accessible, not only to you, but a PI may come in on the weekend and say, I know they did this experiment. I'm writing this grant. i got to find the notebook. It needs to be someplace that's logical for the lab. And generally speaking, notebooks don't leave the lab, OK? Um, so to get started, you want to leave some pages for a table of contents. This table of contents needs to have the date. Oh, they can't see me when I do that. OK, we'll figure this out. They need, it needs to have the date that you did the experiment. So you got to write down the date. It needs to have a title. What did you do? Give it a title. 
and then it should have a page number for a table of contents, which means that your pages need to be numbered. If you're doing this experiment multiple times, you can refer back to the original experiment. But a lot of times in my table of contents, I'll write, awesome experiment, it worked. And that way I can look in my table of contents and say, that's the one I want to publish, not this one where I screwed it all up. And I know where um, the good experiments are. You also want to keep a list of where your protocols are. So I don't write out the whole protocol every time once I've got it figured out. I write it out and then I refer back to it. So you need a list of where those protocols are. So that's table of contents and this is actually table of contents from one of the students in my lab. So I just took a picture of it. Um, specifics for an experiment. Again, date and title. It's hard to fill in the table of contents if you haven't given your experiment a date and a title. A lot of times you want to give a little short intro, most times, justifying what you're doing. One or two sentences so that, you know, hey, I'm making this because we saw that that protein was involved, so we're going to look and see what we can do about further studying it. Make it make sense so that you understand why you're doing it when you come back a year later. Um, have a hypothesis. Every experiment should have a hypothesis, and if you don't know what that hypothesis is, you probably shouldn't be doing it, okay? Um, what's the goal? Why are you doing the experiment? And then we're going to list your methods. I'm going to come back to that because there's a lot of information that goes there. But then at the end, you want to have a short summary or conclusions. Um, did it work? Do you need to repeat it? What do you want to change? What, what did you observe and what do you want to do? Where do you want to go from there? The other thing that's important to have at that point is to have it identified where are your samples? What samples did you collect? What did you call them? And where did you put them? Because somebody down the road is going to need to use them. And then it's also really useful to have who helped with that experiment in there. Even if you just list so-and-so grew the cells or so-and-so helped with this, that becomes useful down the road for writing a paper and who do you need to acknowledge for help? So these specifics are useful in writing the paper, but it's really a lot more than just what you need for writing a paper. Um, your methods. The next mm, few slides are going to be on methods, and it's probably one of the more important parts, and it's the part that you normally think of putting in there. But you also need that hypothesis and summary so you know where you're going. So the first time you do a procedure, you want lots and lots of detail, okay? For the repeat experiments, you can say, hey, I followed this, I changed this to this. And a lot of times that's sufficient. You need to show all your calculations. The number one mistake in making something or make, following a protocol and doing a procedure is your math was wrong. And it doesn't matter if your math is wrong, if you can go back and figure out that your math was wrong. Then it's correctable. If you can't figure out what you did, then it's harder to correct it. So an example of this is you made 75% ethanol. Oops, I put 75 mils of water in with 25 mils of ethanol. Big mistake. But at least I wrote it down so that I know it. Okay. You want to label all your figures and calculations because you don't know what you did if you're in micromoles and the other person's reading it as mm, millimoles or milligrams, okay? So label, 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 date, date, date. For the details, a lot of times it's really useful to, when you use a new reagent, 
to write down where you got it. What's the catalog number? How do you reorder this thing? What lot number is it? Um, if you're using antibodies, what's the clone? Where did it come from? What's it labeled with? How do you, how do you know what antibody you really use? Does it have an expiration date? You know, are you using something that's old and you're just trying it? That's sometimes okay. But if you're going to use it and want to publish it, you might want to get something new. Or if it doesn't work, maybe it's because it expired last month. Maybe it really expires when it says it does. Where is it stored? How do you find it again? When you make solutions, you want to tell how you made them. You can actually give the actual recipe. You can tell whether you made it from scratch, each individual item, or if you had a 10x stock and you just diluted it. But tell how you diluted it. Show your calculations for it. What kind of water did you use? Did you use RO water or DI water, tap water, some other type of water? Put that all in there. If you are growing cells and doing an experiment with cell culture, what kind of cells are they? Where do you get them? Are they cells that you've been passaging? How long have they been in culture? Are they growing normally? Did they look weird? Or did they look like pretty happy cells? Write it down. What medium do you have them in? A lot of times we'll grow a lot of cells in DMEM, but some of our cells grow in RPMI. We need to identify that. If you have used an instrument, a PCR machine or a centrifuge, which one in the lab did you use? Does it have a specific location? Do you have more than one? We've at times had three different PCR machines and one of them quit working. And we figured that out because everybody who used machine number two had really screwy results, like none. So if you know what machine you've used, you can backtrack that and figure out where the problem is. Did you have to wash your samples? Wash your plates? How many washes did you do? How much washing, how much volume did you use in the wash? Your centrifuge speeds, did you spin at 2,000 RPMs or 2,000 Gs? There's a big difference there. Um, how long did you spin? Can you heat it up? Yeah. What temperature? What did you use? Did you put it in a water bath? Did you put it in a heating block? Did you set it in an incubator? Same with mixing it. Did you just vortex and do the normal or did you do something different? Did you sonicate it? List your times between steps, especially if you have long incubations and or even 15 minute incubations, but oh, I had to run to the bathroom. So this one was 20. Write it down. I'll show you in a second what I'm talking about. If you're doing a Western blot or SCS page, agarose gel, what percent of gel did you use? Things run differently based on the percentage. So you need to write all these things down. I've given you a handout, I hope, that everyone has that has some of these listed so that you can then take that back and refer to it once in a while. Okay, can you guys see this? Kind of, sort of? This is an experiment that I did and came out of my lab notebook. And I had written it out ahead of time because I was going to be busy. I was going to have to go back and forth between things. But then I checked it off and wrote the date and or the time that I was doing the individual steps. I hadn't made the buffer, so I put in the pH that I'd actually pH'd it to. I'd left a spot and just put it in there. So you can write it out ahead of time so that you've planned it, but then check it off and fill in as you go. Put in the times for your incubations.
finally you're getting through with the experiment you've collected some data where are you storing that data write that file name down and write down where that file is is it on the computer with the spectra uh, plate reader or is it on your laptop is it on the desktop in the lab where did you store it usually you do not store data on a usb drive okay those are known to fail you can transfer with the usb drive but have it saved someplace as well when you go to write your paper at the end you have an acknowledgement section so you want to acknowledge who's helped you write it down who helped with techniques who provided cells who gave you statistical advice oh we don't have that machine i went to some other lab and used that write it down okay if you're using animals so you have a cage card that tells when the animal was born how old it was uh, where the breeders were you probably want to keep that cage card or at least the information from the cage card and that may be lab specific some labs want a lot more of that others want some of those things kept in a common location so check with your PI ask The second time you do an experiment, you can refer to the original protocol, but, and then just record stop and start times, kind of like I did in that sample. Um, you also need to record any changes that you made to that. The first time through, it doesn't always work. So, okay, I didn't lice with REPA buffer. I made a TRIS based buffer. I made a different type of a buffer. So, Put that in there. Um, if you're going to make that change permanent, and once you've figured it out, you probably want to write out your entire protocol again. And then reference that protocol rather than the first protocol. Okay? Put that new protocol in your table of contents so you know where to find it. Okay, we've talked about experiments, and I've been talking about protocols what's the difference okay the protocol is the basic steps that you're following and you're going to reference that most times so that you don't have to write out yes I did three washes of a hundred microliters and then I centrifuged it and I did this and I did that you can have a generic protocol um, in a generic protocol, you don't have your actual calculations. Those go in your notebook, every experiment. Don't transfer them in by copying them down. If you do it at the scope and you count that you have 200 cells and then you do your math to get cells per mil and you do it on a sticky note, attach that sticky note. Don't just recopy it, okay? But it's even better if you hold a notebook around and actually write it in your notebook, okay? Um, if you make any mistakes, write it down. If you have a problem, write it down. Um, if you have a 96 well plate, well, let's take a 24 well plate, and three of the wells are brilliantly yellow while everything else is still nice pink color of culture media. You look at them and say, those three wells were contaminated, write it down so that you know down the road, hey, those three wells were contaminated. And we know what to do. Um, if you drop a tube on the floor and you lose some fluid, oh, I'll just add some more, write that down. Okay, um, write down your mistakes. You may or may not know them as mistakes ahead of time, but if they're an obvious mistake or difference from the normal protocol, write it down. And then finally, organize it. Don't have it all over the place. It needs to be put together in an organized manner. This can be organizing it 
based on date. Some labs organize it based on an experiment, a whole experiment together. It depends on your PI and the experiments that you're doing. So check and see, but make it so that you can find it. Have sections in your notebook or tabs so that you have a tab for this year from last year and things like that. Um, finally, do's and don'ts. Make it legible. Make it orderly. Have ideas for your next experiments. Comments on it. Have enough information there that someone else with some kind of science background could actually repeat it. Define your definitions or your abbreviations and give all the details possible. If you're going to modify it, don't just change it, cross a line out through it, and then modify it. Don't rewrite your scrap paper, attach it. You don't want to skip pages. That makes it look like you're trying to insert experiments in the middle. Don't leave a lot of blank space. Don't ever take the originals out of the notebook. It stays in. And we don't have much of this around anymore, but don't use whiteout, OK? So then I have another example of a protocol that I had written up. And we were using this regularly. And I highlighted things that I needed to pay attention to. And I crossed things out and put in what I was going to use. So a protocol that you're getting as a sheet of paper can actually be attached, but it probably isn't going to be a clean, perfect protocol if you've actually done the experiment. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tricia, who's going to talk about some of the different practices you need for um, industry. All right. So basically, who am I? My name is Tricia Reddick. I am, ooh a fourth year PhD student in Dr. Tapes' lab. If you want to get a hold of me for whatever reason, you can get a hold of me at T-R-E-T-T-I-G at KSU.edu. So before I came back to grad school, I worked for four and a half years in industry. And I worked at a company in Chicago called SGS. And we're a third party testing company. So what we did is we took samples from uh, different corporate organizations or different research institutions. And we took those samples and tested them as third party testing. Sometimes it was the companies themselves doing this. Sometimes it was mandated by FDA that they send their information to us. So we are a GMP GLP lab. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we were also under constant audits. We were audited by the FDA. We were audited by ISO, which is a quality assurance um, organization. We are audited by the EMA, which is the European version of the FDA. And we were also constantly audited by our clients. So we're going to talk about CGMPs today. These are current good manufacturing pro uh, practices. I'm going to talk about what we did at my work. So these can be different in different areas. Um, but this is what I went through. So CGMPs are regulated by the FDA. You change, uh, they can change depending on what current is. So we may find that information that we weren't recording has now become important or information that we were recording is no longer important. Um, and these are used for different things like final drug products, um, active pharmaceutical ingredients, medical devices, vaccines, things that fall under FDA regulation. So GMPs cover a lot of different areas. They cover standard operating procedures, different document handling, data storage, training. But today I'm going to talk about our documentation practices. So what's the point? The whole point is to ensure an unalterable data trail of what actually happened. So everything that Dr. Fleming talked about still applies to these CGMPs. So we may need these things for audits. Our clients and the FDA are able to come in and look at our data and see what we've done. And also, it can be useful for legal action. Um, either the FDA, again, can come in and request these documents. Otherwise, uh, we've actually had uh, clients ask for documentation to be used against another client. So these are official documents, which means I can actually be called into court for every document that my name is signed on. And we also use CGMPs to ensure uniformity. 
so that there, if there are any alterations that result in what are called deviations, these are, we have records of what happened that changed. Um, these can be in notebook or worksheet form. So the lab that I was in, we had pre-printed worksheets that we filled in as we went along. Our chemistry department, on the other hand, didn't follow uh, the same experimental protocol every single time, so they worked out of lab notebooks. This also applies to your test tubes. So one of our big things is when we label tubes in the lab, normally you put information about what it is on there, but each single time you had to write out the information and initial and date. So one of the tests that we did in our lab actually required five test tubes per sample, and we would run 30 of them at a time. So you would have to go through, label each tube, what's in it, initial and date each single time. So what is the focus of CGMP documentation? The biggest thing about CGMP is that we need to be able to prevent alterations further down the road. So we need to identify if changes were made. We need to be able to have an accurate record of what actually happened. So these are the same things that apply to your lab notebooks. They're just a little stricter for GMP work. So who did what? Initial and date everything. How did they do it? The same things that Dr. Fleming talked about. So this also needs to provide a record that can be checked by other parties. Specifically, we had a QA that looked at all of our work after we did it. So we would do it in the lab and then send it to a quality assurance department who would go back through all of your work every single time and double check that everything that you did was right. So our clients also need to be able to do that as well as the FDA. So these are some of the rules. Um, each person is assigned a set of initials to be used for documentation. So mine in the lab were TR. I very rarely use my middle initial, so I was able to get away with just TR. But we had other Ts and Rs at the company at the same time. So some people had to use middle initials. It had to be rotated to make sure that you didn't have people with the same initials at the same time doing the same work. So we also had signatures, so everybody had to be able to sign their name. And we kept a record of this. You actually had to go back each year and reinitial and re-sign all of your documentation. We had to initial and date so much that your initials sort of degrade after about the first couple of years. So we have to be able to keep track of how has your signature degraded, how your initials degraded, so that way you can actually trace it back to people. So again, all this information must be clearly documented and it must be filled out in real time. And this was a big deal if you had time tests. For example, the test that I did had a one hour incubation. So you put your samples on, turned around, wrote the time, flipped it over, put your samples on. You had to make sure you were keeping track of it, especially because ours had a 60 minute incubation window and it was plus or minus two minutes, that's it. So if you're outside of that incubation window, now you have to worry about deviations because what you've done isn't what you've written down what you've done. So we're going to go through some more of the rules. Um, this must be a permanent record. So no whiteout, no sticky notes, none. So you actually, when uh, the FDA would come in, they would go and hunt down sticky notes and you weren't allowed to have them. They would actually go through the trash and look for them. You have to fully explain your calculations. So this is an example of one of the calculations that we would use. So not only do we say, okay, we have 10 megs of sample and 100 mils of water and made a one meg per mil concentration. Then we go and we explain how we have a one to 10 dilution and what the final result is. And because we had so many people auditing our data, we would also go through and circle that information for us. So that way they could come and find the, the result at the end. But we had to carefully spell out each part of our calculation, not just I made a one to 10, carefully spelled out. One of the biggest things was no write overs. So if you, does my little laser work? All right, so you wrote the date wrong and you're like, well, darn it, this, they know, they can tell, QA would come back to you, no write-overs. Same thing here, if I wrote the date wrong, again, QA can come back to you and tell that there's no write-overs, and they will make you correct these, and we'll go into a little bit about how they have you correct them. And there's no scribbling out mistakes. So in your lab notebook, 
you have a bad habit of scribbling through things, not allowed. You're not allowed to do that at all. So to, when you make a mistake, you have to do a single line out followed by error codes. And these are some examples of some of the error codes. So we'll go through what some of these look like. For example, I wrote the date, it's the wrong date, single line, and then I write my error code. In this case, it's a DT, which stands for a date error code, initial and date, and then I can correct it. Another example would be a transcription error. So I wrote down the sample number, but say I copied it wrong, I would do the same thing. This is using a TR code. So you go through initial and date, TR, circle it so they know what the error code is, and then you can write it correctly. And for example, if you just enter something wrong, this wasn't supposed to be a five, it's an EE for an entry error. And then you can correct it. So these are some different examples of what we had as far as uh, different correction codes. And these all must be done with a single line. So when the year switches, this gets real exciting because we tend to write things incorrectly. So here's a date. All right, I wrote the wrong date. Okay, go through and correct it with a date code. Well, now I did the same thing down here, but I wrote the date wrong again, so you can get these chains of codes. So every time you do it wrong, you have to correct it with a single line out and a new code. So one of the other big things with GMP is that we want to be able to prevent future alterations. So we also want to do things like line out blank sections. Um, you'll recognize this, Dr. Chapes. Uh, so you can use dashes for small areas because here I'm able to dash out the entire line so nobody can write anything in. But if you have big sections, you have to do an entire line through and then initial and date that as well. So that way we know that nobody can come back in and add data to it. You also have to mark the corners of your way tape. This is not legible, not good for GMP, uh, but you have to be able to stick your way tape down and we mark through these corners. So that way you can tell if something was lifted up or if something, a new document was put down. So that way we know that these are still the originals. And they have to be stuck down with permanent double-sided tape. So in conclusion, GMPs are designed to leave an accurate paper trail and also specifically to prevent alterations. It's one of the big things with GMP. Um, it's also to provide a document that can be reviewed by others, whether this is quality assurance or our clients or the FDA. And with that, Dr. Fleming and I will take any questions. <laughs> then? Okay, um, I'm about to do fluid cytology, like do an experiment. How would you write that down in methods? Because I don't know if I'll actually be, be the one doing it, I'll be giving myself to someone in method. If you're going to hand the samples off, you need to know who you handed them off to, what machine and program they're going to use. But before you get to that point, how did you? label your cells and all of that can be written down by you. And then did you reanalyze it after it came back or did you just take their data and how do you open that data? Okay. Other questions? How many of you do have lab notebooks? <laughs> <laughs> and, and how many are you, of you are actually writing a lot in it or just writing a little tiny blurb? What do you normally write? If this were a class, I'd call on you. <laughs> What schools do we have? Um, we have Kingston, KU, or Eden Gloria, Pittsburgh, 
Okay, where's Emporia? <laughs> They're Emporia? Okay, who's, who's got a lab notebook that they write in? How much of this do you write? Do you write more? Do you write less? Do you have differences? Anna's going to answer that question. I think I include all the things you mentioned, but I don't write, for example, quotes every time I made a mistake. I just like make a line and that's it. For in the lab, a lot of times we don't. Um, if you go to industry, you're going to need to. Yes, lots of lots and lots of entry codes. You'd be amazed how many times you mess up. <laughs> so at, at Langston, where's Langston? Is Langston there? I don't see you. Bottom right. Bottom right. Oh, okay. Sarah can point you out, so now you can't hide from me. <laughs> At Langston, how many of you are working in the lab and actually writing down notebooks? All of you are filling out notebooks? Yeah. All of you? Okay. Then yeah. do you write down all this information? Do you write down what kind of water you use when you make a solution? Are there things that you add to this? What? Try that again. You say yes, like distilled water versus like just regular tap water. Right. Yes. So is there anything that you add to your notebook that we didn't discuss? PIs, is there anything you'd like for them to add? I can see a couple of you guys. Okay. Well, it was a very detailed description, and uh, I think my students uh, will really incorporate a few of it for sure. Okay. Sherry, I might have a question for you. Yeah. How, how would you suggest handling an experiment where Maybe you're collecting samples over several weeks um, and then you do the analysis at some point later. A, you got to label the samples and the code to the samples has to be in the notebook. So a lot of times I don't want to label everything on a little tiny tube. So I'll give it a code with a date and collect them all as one big thing, but then you have to have some place in your notebook, and a lot of times I do this on a sheet of paper that I then attach of the code and what it really is. So I still... He wants you facing the oh. camera. Well, I'm looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still keeping it. I can't. It's weird. It doesn't work. Um, I will write them all out on a sheet of paper and keep my code and then attach that code to the notebook. Um, but because that way I've got room to add more as I collect them over time. Does that kind of help? Yeah, so in your notebook then the analysis might be, you may, in the meantime, you might be doing other experiments. So it might be several pages right. for you. And yeah. so if you have this extra sheet of paper that you attach on the first time that you're doing it, first time you're collecting, you can say, hey, here's the codes, and they're from this date, and then collected these samples on another date, and so forth. Does that make sense? But it's using the same code of uh, four hours at, with LPS or with Con A or whatever treatment, and then you can collect it on another day, the same type of thing. Then you can go back and say, I've got a full sheet. I'm going to analyze all of these. That's how we kind of do it. So kind of related to this question. So if you do an ex if you're starting an experiment that you're talking about, and then you go and do another experiment in your lab book, and then you come back and to the class experiment again in your lab book, how do you link those pages? Do you color code them? Do you number them? Do you there's a there well the pages should all be numbered so you should be able to say continuation of page something another experiment from this date another way that I've seen do it people do it is 
having a, it's not leaving spaces in the lab notebook, but having another notebook that they keep all one experiment data together with, and then they attach that or put all this data in this notebook at this page. So linking it is really important and probably one of the harder things to do because you don't do all of one experiment in one day. But so long as it's linked and the files are linked, you're okay. I guess you can also do that in the table of contents. Like have your Definitely notes. do it in the table of contents, yeah. So in industry, we do it by C page, whatever. So if we have to have multiple pages of things, it's here's the first page, everything's stapled together, and it'll say uh, C page two, like if we've got a bunch of sequence IDs or we've got a bunch of uh, timestamps and it's easier just to write them all out in a list, C page two, in parentheses, go to the next page, and that way you can follow it that way. Because things aren't linked in a notebook, it's linked as, ours were linked by worksheets, but that way it was yeah. referenced, see page whatever. And that's what I do in my lab notebook too. See page whatever, date this, so that way I can find it again. And we use a lot of worksheets, even in my lab. That. Other questions, comments? I'm supposed to look this way, but I can't see it. So what would you use a, Worksheet for. Give us some examples of worksheets. An example would be we're, well, we do animal surgeries and we need to write in the time that we open them, the time that we put a clamp on, the time that we take that clamp off, and it changes from day to day. And you want each animal specifically knowing what your timing is. So we have a worksheet for that. Um, we have a 96 well template that you fill out the template as to where you're putting all your samples on this template and where you're putting them in the well. And then you can attach that to the data when you're doing a large ELISA or other type of plate assay. Um, what else do you... I mean, our, so our worksheets were set up that they were all carefully outlined in the SOP. You had to, if you've made any revisions to the, I mean, even if you removed a space, you had to have documentation that you changed a worksheet. So it's been four and a half years since I filled one out now, four, uh, three and a half years. So we had sample names, we had page numbers, all of our samples were carefully identified with their own unique ID. We had products, we had lots, we had descriptions. Um, uh, we had for an Eliza. Yeah, I mean yeah. they're they're modified, but I mean it's Let's, it's all of your calculations, all of our timestamps went on there, all of our timers went on there. But because it was the same protocol every single time, you could use one worksheet versus writing it all in a lab notebook. So, what is there a particular size of notebook that you use, or a particular brand, or something that? I think that's lab specific. A lot of labs want the bound kind so that you can't tear pages out. I use bound or spiral sometimes as well. But then I, my lab actually has a loose leaf notebook for all the templates and they're linked that way rather than stapling them in and making your, your bound notebook gets too thick just because you've got too many pages in it. Um, having the loose leaf isn't as it isn't GMP at all, okay? <laughs> but it works for our lab. And so, you know, labs are going to have specific differences as well. Um, some labs want a full discussion and intro in there. I've worked in one lab where they didn't want me wasting the lab book space. And that went in another book. So, you know, it just depends on the lab. Multiple people use the same lab book? Usually, each lab book is for one person. I don't think I've ever seen people sharing a lab book. In an industry that's different, we have multiple people writing on the same worksheet. So that's how we initial and date everything. I may fill out the top part, but I didn't do the test. So I give that to somebody else, and then they initial and date all of their stuff. So each chunk kind of has an initial and date so you can track who did what bit because that worksheet may go to four different people. And they're starting to go to electronic notebooks as well. So trying to get all of this documented electronically is another whole game.
Does anybody have any other questions before we finish up? You have to say survey right online, right? All right, then. I guess if nobody has any more questions, then we're going to finish up here. Um, I appreciate everybody coming, and we did record this, so if your students can't make it, I will hopefully have it up on the website next week, and um, hope to see you all next month for the um, digital poster um, seminar. So, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.